So thank you very much, Greg, for having me here. Uh, you are at the epicenter of the energy conversation, which is why I agreed to come. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you to m and Bank for sponsoring this uh, speaker series. And thanks to all of you for coming out on a sunny and windy day uh, to spend time with, with each other. So I'm interested, so I've been on this campus two other times. Uh, once when we cut the ribbon on your turbine, uh, which was incredibly exciting with Governor O'Malley, you may have been here too. Uh, and then another time shortly after the governor was re-elected, uh, he did a sustainability workshop here with about 800 people. Um, I don't know if you remember that, but it was quite a, <laughs> I remember every moment of it. Um, but anyway, I want to know who you are first. I want to know sort of the audience I'm talking to. So if you don't mind raising your hands, if you are a student, if you're anyone here a student at Chesapeake College, oh great, good, it's nice to see you. Um, anyone in the solar industry? I knew you were going to raise your hand. Are you CEO members? Okay, I'll be extra nice to you. Uh, anyone? <laughs> Thank you for coming. Anyone in local government? Yeah, where? Oh, hey, yeah, I see you now. Nice to see you. Oh, great. Welcome. Um, how about anyone who works at the university who's not a student, or works at the, at the uh, community college who's not a student? Any other? Ah, great. Welcome. And uh, other business interests, chambers of commerce, yeah. chamber of commerce. All right, who am I missing? I see an offshore wind colleague here, Ross. It's nice to see you. What 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 other groups am I missing? Oh, great. The oysters. Oh, wonderful. Great, great, great. Yeah, sir. Ah, of course. Oh, good, good, good. All right, we have you represented. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice to see you. How are you? Oh, good. Good, good, good. Yes. Good. All right, anyone I miss? Yes. Center for Environment Society. Wonderful. Good. Good, good, good. Anyone else want to raise their hand? All right. That helps me know. So what I heard was that you're an intensely educated <laughs> uh, uh, audience about, about the energy of tomorrow, today and tomorrow. So I'm just gonna start, I would be remiss. Let me just say one other thing. So Greg um, gave kind of the, like sort of the job titles, um, but I just wanna put a little bit more color on it. Um, I do represent the solar industry now. That is my job and my passion. Uh, but it is new. I, um, I just started in January. Um, before that, I did serve the president. Um, and I, I focus, so I'm sure exactly zero, one of you has knows what the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management does, but it is a federal agency that is in charge of 1.3 billion acres offshore. So all offshore energy. Majority of what I did was oil and gas. So I regulated the oil and gas industry for a couple of years. Um, and then offshore wind. Um, obviously, in terms of portfolio, I spent... 85% of my time on oil and gas and a much smaller percentage of my time on renewables. Prior to that at Maryland Energy Administration, I did a ton of stuff on energy efficiency, kind of the whole spectrum of renewable energy, as well as a lot of work with our electric distribution utilities um, and our natural gas facilities, our nukes, our export facility at Cove Point. So sort of an entire gamut of, um, of the energy space. And then I worked for the regulator, uh, the, low, the state regulator for a couple of years as their legal counsel. So um, I tell you that to say that I'm not, I, I, I don't know everything there is to know about solar. I don't know everything there is to know about wind. I don't know everything there is to know about electric distribution utilities, but I certainly worked with all of them and sort of come at this from that perspective. That being said, I would not be doing a good job if I, uh, let's say, if I, it makes a noise. If I didn't just give you a quick introduction to the organization, uh, that I represent now. So we are the National Trade Association for the Solar Industry, uh, founded in 1974, uh, which was, I was barely hearing then, um, but we represent about a thousand member companies across the United States. There's 9,000 companies involved in the solar industry in the United States. We represent about a thousand. You can imagine one of my jobs is to grow that number, but our mission is to build a strong solar industry and to uh, our goal, 100 gigawatts of solar by 2020. I will try hard not to speak in gigawatts and megawatts and sort of those words that can be really industry specific. But I catch, feel free to stop me if I do. Uh oh, wrong way. So let's talk about what our energy, before we talk about what our energy 
of the future looks like, let's talk about what it look, sort of where we are today. And looking at, um, one way to look at that is through greenhouse gas emissions, uh, because that's a lens through which we tend to look at uh, a lot of energy sources. Obviously you can read, so I'm not gonna read it to you, but suffice it to say, electricity makes up a big percentage of our um, greenhouse gas emissions here in the United States. You look at what makes up our generation, sort of what energy are we using and have we used historically? We obviously are talking a lot about this right now. Um, you can see over the course of the last eight years, nine years, um, natural gas has grown. You all know why, right? Tran sort of transformational and disruptive technologies in um, fracking have allowed much more access to natural gas that has changed the economics of electricity generation. Coal has fallen, others have remained fairly flat, with the exception of non-hydro renewables, which is this light blue line. So it's increasing. Obviously, as a share, it is not close to natural gas or coal or nukes, but it is certainly increasing. Um, and then what sort of what does that look like as we look at new capacity? So I'm sure. You read the newspaper, you watch, you watch whatever your news channel of choice is. Um, there's lots of conversations about coal plants retiring, uh, new generation being built. And in, this shows how that has evolved over the last six years. Um, obviously, natural gas has been a huge chunk of new addition. So this is just new additions of energy. Um, it's particularly exciting to us uh, that solar uh, has in this year, 2016, for the first time, was the, the largest source of new generation in the United States. So as we sort of stood head to head against natural gas, wind, and other sources, we had more solar in this country than any other new source of generation. I think it's important because I, I know when I speak to folks, they often think that solar is sort of a niche, a niche technology, a science project maybe, um, and it is clearly evolving far beyond that. And then uh, last but not least, sort of making that link between uh, renewables and our electricity generation and, and greenhouse gas emissions, we have made a fair amount of progress on reducing emissions as we have grown renewable generation, that's the yellow line, but still a long way to go, clearly, still a long way to go. So let me talk a minute about solar because it's my, it's my, uh, my job at the moment. Um, but it is real. I think this graph just speaks to two things. One, it speaks to the uh, meteoric, that's not my word, but the meteoric rise and growth of the solar industry and solar installation across the United States. You can see it went from sort of a nascent industry earlier in the decade to being the largest source of new generation in the country. Um, but it also speaks, and, and the, the different colors are just the different kinds of solar, right? The ones that are on your house versus the ones that are in your field versus the ones that are huge power plants and then um, different kinds of huge power plants. But it also sort of speaks to the importance and the relevance of, of federal policy. So uh, we, the ITC stands for the investment tax credit. That is a federal policy that has been important in growing solar. You can see as things get extended and uh, expanded, obviously that helps incent the growth of solar. Um, I could show you a chart with wind and we can talk about the production tax credit. I can show you a chart with uh, more traditional fuels and the tax credits and the tax incentives they get. So that's, you know, tax policy and energy go hand in hand. That there are ways in which our tax code incents all different kinds of technology across the spectrum. But I'm just showing you the one for solar now just to make that point that energy generation and policy are intricately mixed regardless of the source. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind as we think about what the energy of the future will look like. So, none of us know exactly what the demand will be and what the energy future will be, but we can, we have really smart people that spend a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, as those folks look out over the next 25 years, there's a, <laughs> this doesn't look particularly flat, actually. If you look at this graph, I think it's only because it starts at 94 over there. We started at zero. Uh, on the left-hand side, it would look pretty flat. So this is relatively flat growth over the course of the next 25 years. Um, that's important because the utilities will tell you as you think about low growth and about where your customers are gonna come from uh, and, it, and there's not this increasing demand for your product, 
you got to figure out what business model works. But it's important to think about um, total energy growth is relatively flat over the next 25 years. But, but what's going to fuel that, the energy that we do need, right? So where are the sources of this? And this is, uh, this is not really a prediction. This is solving for an outcome. So our National Renewable Energy Lab, um, which is one of the DOE uh, labs, did a study. And they, they said, well, okay, if we want to have 80% of our energy come from renewable energy sources by 2050, what would that look like? Where would that generation come from? And this, this is sort of using financial models and technology advances and demand. This is what they think where 80% of our energy could come from. So it's one scenario to think about. Uh, and it's one scenario that they solved for. But you can see that uh, solar could make up 30% of that by 2050. Onshore wind could be a chunk of that. Offshore wind could be a piece of that as well. So a pretty um, interesting mix of different technologies. I should stop right there and say 2050 is, I don't know how many, like almost 35, 33 years away. You think back 33 years and had a chart like this, right? Many of the technologies that we're talking about now wouldn't even be on that chart, right? So this is sort of predictive and thoughtful, but it's certainly not a, um, a statement about what it will be. I, I feel strongly that some of the technologies that are, are nascent now uh, are the ones that will actually make up whatever percentage it ends up being. I think some of the technology storage, you mentioned storage, as we, as we continue to make progress and figure out how to bring down the economics of storage, that those things will be influenced. If we figure out how to create microgrids and create microgrids in our communities, that and, and how we fuel those, that will influence this. But it's all of those pieces together and the, the development of that technology that will continue to drive this. And then we have to think about how we get around, right? So and we've, I've been focusing on electricity, uh, but electricity isn't the only source of our energy use, obviously vehicles a huge source of our energy use as opposed to our electricity use, um, historically our electricity use. Um, and so, so people that think about this all the time think that electric vehicles are gonna continue to be a larger part of our market, a larger part of the transportation sector. And obviously then if, they're, if they have ele more electric vehicles, more demand, more electricity demand. And so this just gives you a sense in millions of what uh, the adaptation will be. And this is from the National Energy Information Administration. So this, I'm not giving you the numbers from the uh, Electric Vehicle Trade Association or sort of a, someone that produces electric vehicles. This is from our uh, federal government that does all of these kinds of projections. And so it's a pretty, um, pretty significant change in the way in which we're gonna get around and how we're gonna fuel the way in which we get around. So if, you, if you think back to the slide about electricity, sort of energy demand being relatively flat, and electricity demand being relatively flat, this is actually a way in which that could change. This could change that trajectory. We have millions and millions of us driving around in electric vehicles as opposed to you know, gasoline uh, vehicles. We're gonna use more and more electricity. And so as we think about what does that mean for our grid? What does that mean for where we get energy? What does that mean for our infrastructure? Those are important things to think about. One of the other things, and I don't want to get too wonky, but one of the other things is to think about how can we use all those electric vehicle chargers, right? There's some here on campus. There's maybe some at your homes. Um, how can our utilities use those, pull those together, use those as sort of dispatchable units, charge into them, pull off of them uh, when you need energy? So there's lots of, lots of things that can happen, but this is a piece of the puzzle. I mean, I think there's, probably consensus that this is happening. People could uh, have a debate about how quickly this is happening, uh, but I think it will change the energy world of the future. And again, you know, I have to talk about solar. So solar will continue to be a part of that. As we look at uh, what that means, we think uh, almost 5% of electric generation by 2022. Uh, that's pretty quick rate of adoption given uh, where we have been, we're at 1.4% now. Um, and we think it will be sort of across these different scales. Um, residential is obviously the ones on your roof, if you're a homeowner. Non-residential are like the ones in your here, commercial. 
uh, an industrial. So if the roof of Target, I don't know, your local Target, your local Walmart, my guess is there's likely a, a solar array on their roof. Those are the two biggest uh, corporate consumers of solar in the United States last year. Um, and the utility are the, we don't, we don't have that many big utility scale projects here in Maryland. There's, um, there are a few, but if you fly over a lot of the western part of our country, look out the airplane, you will see huge solar arrays. And those are, those are big power plants. I mean, that's what they are. They're big power plants. Um, and so those, all of those sections of the market have continued to evolve uh, and will continue to evolve. If you look here in 2016, there was a huge jump in utility scale solar, which I'm happy to talk about why if you, if you wanna ask me later. So why is this happening? And I, I'm using the solar slide, but it really makes the point uh, for all the technologies. It's sort of that, that um, chicken and egg, you get, you get more, more demand drives lower prices. So the more you build, the, lower, the more that cost reductions can happen. So you create demand to bring down prices, and that is certainly what we've seen in the solar industry. And that chart shows you as demand, has, as demand and installations have, have increased, price has fallen. Happens in the, offshore, in, the, well, in the offshore wind industry, certainly we've seen in Europe. Demand increases, installations increase, prices have fallen dramatically. It's happened in land-based wind, similarly happened in electric vehicles, it's happened in iPhones, it's happened in computers. I mean, there's nothing particularly unique about the, the, the commodity of energy and electricity that, has, that makes this true, but it certainly is true in the area of, of energy and certainly solar. And so as we think about kind of these new technologies, sort of pairing storage with electricity, building microgrids, uh, thinking about other kinds of technologies, knowing that there is this price component, sort of more demand equals lower prices. How do you create policy and how do you create markets for those technologies will help bring down price, make it more affordable, make it easier to compete with other technologies. So that is a huge piece of energy of the, the energy world of the future is marrying sort of the policy and the technology in a way that makes sense. So I just have to crow a bit about the solar market. Um, not usually can you stand in front of a group and say that your industry grew 97% in one year. Um, it is exciting, it is uh, inspiring, and it is entirely unsustainable, so I'm aware of that. I think don't grow 97% year over year uh, in a sustainable way. So uh, there was, there's a, many reasons why, uh, why that happened, a lot having to do with policy. Um, but it's still pretty amazing that 14.8 uh, gigawatts, and again, I, I'll try to make that my only uh, use of the term gigawatt in our conversation today. We talked about a little bit about this. Um, we reached over a million rooftops, a million solar rooftops in the United States. It took us, you know, 10 years to get to a million, and then it's going to take us about two years to get to two million. And then it's going to take us less years to get to three million. It's incredible, the speed. We talked a little bit about uh, new installation. And then think about this, a new solar installation is completed every 84 seconds. This is not kind of a energy, this is not energy of the future, this is energy uh, of right now. So, what, all the, what do our citizens think about this, right? <laughs> hopefully I've made the point that energy and policy are intricately linked. Uh, policy hopefully reflects the uh, interests of our citizens. Um, and there is without a doubt overwhelming public support for renewable energy writ large, and then uh, solar in particular. And so as we look across uh, time and look across uh, our citizens, more than about 65% say they favor alternative energy over fossil fuel development. And um, if we just pull on solar alone, you know, do you support solar? Not in opposition to some other technology, but do you support more solar development? The numbers get to about 85 and 90 percent. Um, it is not a partisan issue. It is uh, actually incredibly nonpartisan issue uh, in terms of who's choosing to purchase solar. So one of um, a company in the last month or so uh, released their results. They pulled voter registration data from here, and they pulled solar installation data from here, and they married the two. And it's about 55% Democrats, 45% Republicans that are putting solar on their homes. I mean, you, you can make some assumptions about how people vote versus how they are 
I guess if they registered, that's how they identify themselves. But anyway, uh, it's, you know, it's not like all the Ds are putting solar and all the Rs are saying, no way, I don't want that technology. Uh, it's pretty diverse. If you look at the states where there's the most solar installation in the United States, about half are led by Democratic governors and about half are led by Republican governors. There's uh, a really interesting crossover. If we look at uh, support in the United States Congress for solar, I told you the investment tax credit is sort of the most important piece of federal policy. Um, it was extended at the end of 2015 in a bipartisan uh, agreement. So it was uh, voted on, you know, it wouldn't pass, it was just Democrats, obviously. Um, I spend a lot of time with Republican congressmen and Republican senators who are adamant that solar in particular is an incredibly, um, incredibly important to their constituents because it provides low cost energy, energy independence, an ability to remove themselves from the grid, uh, and that they are intensely supportive of it in ways that sort of defy a really simple characterization around blue and red. Um, and so I think that's important. I don't think that's unique. I know it's not unique to solar. You know, some of the large, the biggest um, uh, supporters of pol federal policy for wind generation are Republicans from the Midwest, whose states have really benefited from that. Uh, we have um, uh, Governor Baker and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts doing offshore wind. So it's, you know, this is, I, I, I challenge people to think a little bit more broadly than um, kind of a, trying to simplify it into a Republican and Democratic issue. It really is um, something that consumers want and many, many of our elected officials get. One of the things I think, um, that we really ha we, in all honesty, we really have an uh, opportunity to work on is uh, who has access to solar, right? That is certainly one of the criticisms. It's not just solar, it's sort of renewable energy in general, uh, making sure that it's not merely upper income folks that can afford many of these new technologies, but it really is something that is available across communities. Um, we have work to do. We, it's it's an okay story as it stands right now, but it, there's, there's more progress to be made. Um, a lot of middle income homes, as you can see, uh, our, our customers, there are new policies, community solar. I think we have a pilot here in the great state of Maryland, um, which really allows more folks to have a piece of a solar farm. There's obviously work on uh, multifamily homes and different kind, of, uh, different kind of scenarios, but it really is something, again, as we go into the energy world of the future, ensuring there's equity and inclusion and opportunity, uh, both for customers to enjoy the, the low cost and the, and the energy security benefits, as well as sort of the workforce. We haven't talked much about the workforce, we, we will, uh, but making sure that the workforce also uh, is, a, is, is open and welcoming to uh, all of our citizens. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Maryland, 14th in the nation, which is, we're, we're kind of small, so that's good. I'm obviously, I live in Maryland, I'm from Maryland, so, so it is a wee thing. Uh, 5,400 jobs, 68,000 homes. Um, it's growing and it will continue to grow, as you can see, over the next few years. Um, and this is the job one. So, the, and I won't talk a ton about, about the, the jobs in solar, but again, it's sort of a piece of the puzzle, right? Energy, energy is one of the foundational um, industries of our nation, right? So if I just left the oil and gas world, spent time on offshore rigs, tons of time in Houston, tons of times in New Orleans, tons of time in Alaska. Um, these are real jobs with real benefits for real families. Uh, similarly, uh, this energy of the future provides that same benefit. So in the solar industry, there's 260,000 jobs last year. Um, just to give that some context, there were, that is more jobs uh, than Facebook, Apple, and Google combined, uh, which is a, a different way of looking at it. Um, I don't spend a lot of time comparing myself to other energy sources, but if I was going to, I would tell you that there's about 100,000 jobs in wind, not that we don't like wind, um, there are more, obviously there's more jobs now in solar than there is in the coal industry. Uh, in the mere extraction of fossil fuels, there's more jobs in solar than in that. If you think about processing and delivery of oil and gas, absolutely, there's more jobs there. But just the extraction process, uh, we, we give them a run for their money. 
Um, and so it's, again, I, I share that because I think there's sort of this concept that these new technologies, these different technologies are sort of on the fringe. Uh, and I, I challenge you to acknowledge and accept the fact that these are your neighbors and your uh, family and your friends that are actually working in this industry and will continue to work in this industry. I mean, if I showed you the chart, which I won't, all the projections are that those will continue to grow and grow across the country. Um, I, early on in my tenure, I did spend a lot of time in Alaska, and I read an article in a, a trade, uh, like just an energy thing about um, a solar company in uh, Anchorage. And I just called them up. I was like, hey, you are real entrepreneurs. I would really love to talk to you. But they're building solar in Alaska. Um, I'm going to just touch on some of these topics. They are not unique. They are all about how the, the sort of the, sol the uh, energy world of the future and the things that we got to figure out. And then I'm going to stop and answer your question. Um, our, pres our new president talks a ton about trade and sort of domestic manufacturing versus imports. That's particularly true for a lot of energy technologies, right? A lot of industries. If you think about your iPhone, which for once is not on my body, but um, not all manufactured here in the United States, right? Uh, solar panels, some are manufactured here, some are not. Wind turbines, some are manufactured here, some are not. Uh, Levi jeans, some are manufactured here, some are not. So this is, a, this is again, not unique to uh, the energy industry, but certainly a piece that our new president has shined a light on, shown, shine a light on, as something that we have to be thoughtful about as we think about how to keep moving forward. Obviously, what our new president, um, I remind people we actually don't have a new Congress. We've had a Republican Congress for a while. Uh, but our new administration and sort of what their thoughts are about energy policy, how that impacts the energy of the future, uh, how we are even changing the conversation. If any of you are energy geeks like I am, uh, Secretary Perry's memo uh, or study about base load generation and the impact that, that intermittent resources, sort of solar and wind, are having on the grid and how do we. How do we account for that? Um, it happened, I don't know, two and a half weeks ago. And so, so what does the new administration mean for the energy world of the future? Access to capital, none of this happens without money. And so how comfortable are financiers with both the sort of existing new technologies and the technologies of the future? How do you get investors comfortable with that? How do you create pilot projects so that they understand the technology, they understand the outputs, uh, and then they can get comfortable? It's a, a, it's a fascinating thing. One of the things we have seen in this industry, which, which is replicable across wind and microgrids and other things, is that sort of the early movers often spend a lot of time, money, and energy to cracking the code, right? Figuring out how to get investors comfortable with something. And once they've done that, it's easy for others to come in and benefit from that early work. And so one of the most interesting things someone said to me earlier was, uh, not earlier today, but, um, recently uh, was that um, disruptors can be disrupted. And so as we think about this new energy economy that we're entering, that we're in and will continue to develop, we need entrepreneurs, we need big thinkers, and then those big thinkers could be sort of uh, at risk as, the, as it evolves. So if you think about, you know, Xerox or, you know, some of those other things where those technologies just got kind of eaten. Um, workforce development, we can talk more about this specifically, you know, as, as this uh, college's role, um, making sure they have the right training programs and the right information about what kind of workers we need. Uh, we were talking earlier, we have, you know, a ton of electricians in the solar industry. And so it's, it's, there are trades that are um, sort of, you know, there are, there are training programs, making sure people have access to the application of those trades is important. Obviously, how, uh, how these technologies interplay with each other, not just from a um, technological point of view, sort of a technology, how do, we, how do we make sure that they work, which is important, but also sort of customer choice, like what do customers want? Do customers want solar on their roof and a battery in their basement so they can completely cut off from the grid? Do, do they want uh, an EV charging station where they can put in their EV and then charge it back, you know, and their solar panel runs it? and their wind turbine does something, do we want, you know, what do we want and what do customers want, right? We can come up with the best ideas in the world, but if our customers, if your customer doesn't want them, it doesn't really matter. Uh, customer protection, as many of these are, are customer-facing products. If you're trying to sell, 
people in Easton on your energy storage project, you know, that, that is, uh, it is important that you ensure the adequate kind of customer protection. And then last, but certainly not least, how does all of this work with the grid? Um, for those of you that I don't know, one of the things I did, um, you might recall the derecho and the, through all the outages that happened after the derecho hit. Uh, and the governor asked me, I was sitting in a um, Mexican cafe in West Annapolis with my family, and the governor called me and he said, I need you to do, a to put together a task force and study how we can harden the grid and pay for it. I was like, okay. And he said, I need you to do it in 60 days. And I was like, okay, <laughs> should probably stop eating now. Then. Um, and so we did that. And we spent a ton of time and energy with many of your companies in this room figuring out what does that look like and then trying to map a path forward. But certainly, as we think about more um, uh, decentralized generation, right? So if I am at my own power plant at my house and you're your own power plant at your house and you're your own power plant at your house, how do we, A, do we still need a central grid? I would posit yes. And two, if so, how do we pay for that? So what's the uh, appropriate allocation of costs for the grid? And so that's obviously something that Delmarva and that Easton and that every single utility in this country is thinking about. Um, some are more proactive and thinking about it, sort of how do we incorporate all this? Others are more um, uh, oppositional and thinking we don't want any of it to stay out of our state. <laughs> and Maryland's not like that, I promise. But, uh, but that is a real question and there's a real, it, you know, we have had a utility business model for over 100 years um, and how does it need to evolve and what does that look like? And so as we think about the energy world of the future, bringing in distributed generation, bringing in new technologies, bringing in new business models, what's the role of the utility and how do we um, keep that all in place? And so I think that is the end of my slides. Yes, just happy people with solar panels. Uh, that's the end of my slides. So I hope I've left plenty of time. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your comments, and your questions. To you, yes, hi. Welcome. So the gas, gas, yeah. cars? Yeah, well, I think it's sort of going back to that electric vehicle adoption slide, sort of how do we, how do we think about different ways of getting ourselves places and, and having the cars that are technically capable of doing that, but then have that consumer appeal. Um, and I think it is, I mean, I'd be interested in what others have to say, but I do think it is sort of one of those kind of, you got to get over the hump. And I, I don't know about you, but everyone I know now wants a Tesla. I mean, we can't afford them, but, but we would like them. <laughs> um, and I do think it is also infrastructure, right? And that's sort of, an, in my opinion, appropriate role of government to think about what infrastructure do we need to allow people to charge on their way from X to Y. I don't know if that answered your question, but those are some of my thoughts. There's about four million across the country, so that is not a high percentage, not at all. But there's a, we, I mean, so projections are that that will uh, continue at a pretty rapid rate. Um, sorry, don't look, it's gonna give you a headache. Uh oh, uh, a pretty rapid rate of an EV, is that EV? Yeah, EV adoption. So. Again, that's not that still 30 million cars is not the majority of the market, but it's a lot more than we have now. Uh, yes, ma'am. I read an article uh, just yesterday uh, of something that I kind of worried about. Uh, it said that because of the uptake in fracking mm -hmm. and the uh, gas output that they are doing, that that has slowed the research, the technolo technology research for renewables, for wind and solar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the only place I've seen that. I've kind of wondered about it before. Uh, it's the only place I've seen it in writing. Oh, what about that? Has it slowed the research because of this flood of gas? So I will, I will, I have one data point to basically answer on, and that is the federal funding 
for that research. I can't speak to kind of individual companies. I don't have visibility into that, but certainly under the last eight years of our prior president, um, there, the funding for renewables increased fairly dramatically uh, and was um, at, at record rates. And so I, I don't think there was. I think um, there's certainly the downward pressure on prices as, as with the, the, with the um, incredible amount of, of natural gas we have in this country. As electricity prices have gone down, it has put pressure on renewable energy. And, you know, it makes the, the, the differential between them wider. Um, and so that has definitely happened. But in terms of money for research and development, I, have, I do not think that's the case. Yes, you're the host. You get to ask. <laughs> no, no, just the host, the host. Uh, so um, a lot of the price certainty in the market for renewables is a function of tax credits that you squabble over and nation that you appreciate over in Congress when you talk about it in years. John, unspoken behind all of this, is the $250 million tax credit that actually is coming to the next off the field strategy. Yes. Is it the role of industry now to begin to advocate for a change in the tax code that might help release some of that pressure you're talking about by creating a more unlevel? By trying to remove some of the, the disparities and incentives between the fossil fuel industry and the contemporary industry. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, different people have different opinions about that. So it's a political question. In my opinion, it's a political question. It's sort of, you know, the, the reality is true. Uh, and so as a political person, do you want to sort of pick a fight and, and do that? Or do you want to just sort of focus on what you need? I think so both wind and solar have, we both have um, on the PTC, the production tax credit, the investment tax credit, there was a bipartisan agreement, like I said, to phase them out over a certain period of time. Um, I think as we, you know, I think our, our, rhetoric, our rhetoric really should be around an equal playing field, right? That's really what we want and, and being real about what that equal playing field means. And it's, you know, it's a tax code. It is indemnification for nuclear plants. I mean, there's, it's ripe throughout our, um, the construct of energy that we have created. And I do think it, it, it will be incumbent upon all of us to call it out, right? We talk a lot about um, equal playing fields. So if we talk about it, we shouldn't mean it. And the other piece of that, that that I didn't mention was sort of how do we, should we, and if so, how do we um, monetize all the externalities of energy production? And so not to sound wonky, I'll translate that. Like how do we, is there a, monet, is there a, a way to, to put a cost, a cost on carbon or a cost on clean air or a benefit to clean air or a cost to even pricing signals. You know, if you bring energy into a really congested part of the grid, is that more valuable than if you bring it in in the middle where no one is? Like how do we account for all of these other attributes of energy that are, don't show up in it costs 8.3 cents on my bill? That's the conversation I think we need to be having as well. Yes? Mm -hmm. Right. So how do you see this playing out in the future as, it's, as, as we get more efficient or do we just ignore that? Just, don't you know, ignore that's, that's not on the table. Yeah, no, don't ignore it. Uh, you have hit on someone asked, that, actually the president of, of the college asked me if the renewable energy, um, renewable energy is yet along, right? Do we, is there friction between us? And sometimes there is, sometimes there historically there has been friction and Sort of, I liken it to, if there, you know, if, if there's a piece of pie this big, then I'm going to fight with you about how much you're going to get and how much I'm going to get. But if we can just make a bigger pie, we don't have to fight. Similarly, on the energy efficiency side and the renewable side, there has sometimes been this tension. Uh, I'm not a believer in it. I, I, I believe strongly. What is it, Ross? Is that, you know, the, the best kilowatt of energy is the one that you never use. I, I actually think that's true, even though I represent the solar industry. And so I think energy efficiency always has to come first. Good policy is energy efficiency comes first, and then you figure out how you fill in the energy needs. And so that's been my, you know, when I worked for the governor, that was our philosophy. That's certainly my philosophy now. And so just as a real life example, California is shutting down Diablo Canyon, a nukes, nuclear plant in 2025. And so there's this um, proposal for how to fill, that's actually a huge uh, gener generation source. And so how do you fill it? And Initially, there was some um, 
a bit of a tussle between energy efficiency world and renewable energy world around what you do. I think we've gotten over that because it's the right thing to do. But it's a great question. Yes, sir. You have a slide about uh, the different number of points of solar. Mm -hmm. I became the president of SIA. No, just, kidding. <laughs> just kidding, that's a lie. Uh, it's a good question. Um, um, the reason for that is, I can't remember which direction it was. That way? Hold on, I'm gonna find it. Yeah, 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 right. So it sort of speaks to the um, to Greg's question about the impact of policy on on demand. So in the end, so the investment tax credit was slated to expire at the end of 2016. This is what's been installed. So if, in order to have it installed by the end of 2016, you gotta get the contracts, you know, start development in these years. You guys can tell me exactly when. Uh, so everyone knew that they have to have stuff installed and in service by the end of 2016 in order to get that tax credit. So there's tons of, of stuff in development. In 2015, in December, they extended the investment tax credit, but there's already all this like pipeline. And so tons of stuff got built. That's the 97%. Um, this year, there's like, whew, we made it. We already built all, there's, there was some hang hangover. So, yeah, stuff that got pushed once they needed had more time. So the majority of it was built here. The other thing that happened, and partly why this is that even more of a dip, um, and it's all in that utility scale solar, uh, utilities are usually the off taker, is that um, much of the utility uh, procurement has already happened. So they've sort of already covered what they need um, and will have in place by 2018. 2019 is when the utility scale stuff, the procurement's kind of run out or the requirements go up again, and that's why that goes up. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But market trends with policy overlay. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yes, sir. Great question. I'd, I'd be interested in what others on the shore. I mean, I've, I've um, I have heard. So obviously, I'm sort of connected here in Maryland. So I've heard of the, the sort of tensions that continue. But I'd be interested in what others think about that. How do we go? Where? How do we get there? Y'all are from here. How do we solve this? Hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Have lunch. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. That's exciting. How about the current? And after all, we'll get caught in this global warming. Hopefully, no one's going to drown. Yeah. Um, I think the other answer to your question, um, you know, is to sort of change the, I, not in my backyard, to yes, in my backyard, right? So I think about at, at, when I was at the Maryland Energy Administration, we had uh, whole programs around energy efficiency and renewables for farmers, right? And sort of the processes, right? The, the tanks and the chicken houses and all of these things that when people save money, they, you get their attention. And so that's, I think, sort of the narrative. You need more and more citizens that have saved money and can test, be a testament. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. That's awesome. Yes. You, no, you, Red, or Pepco. Tell my right.
she got that kick out of the story. So it's awesome to be caught, you know, in terms of their going to see them at the offset and all the talk to that. So I think the biggest thing that needs to be considered is talk a little bit. And some of these kids, you know, she was like, okay, in an intense game, you can get in a very long time. Like, mm -hmm. but like, you do in terms of three. And then they realize that their intensity day is going to be after the intensity stage, right? So they get put on it or they can fly out immediately. And then another time, you can get almost too stressful. And then you can finally get to the down and have your kids. You know, so it's taking these pipelines for like two years, and all of a sudden, you know, we're always in a single period based on capital. And then a lot, a lot of the time, you know, you want to open up like a full unbranched business, or you have to go down on power over time, you have to make some sense. But the public service commission doesn't let us, you know, have that opportunity to do it. So it's only going to pay for it. You know, who's going to take all the business? <laughs> no, what, our whole model is this. We, we want to make a model what the answer is. What the conversation is going to be. So it's sort of a technology We actually talk about turbine technology as an operating mode of aggregate. Which is a big solo that you've got to hire a solo technology. So how, and now, how do we start so many of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greg, you're in charge of time. Tell me when. Oh, okay. um, I think I Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, land conservancy. <laughs> So those projects come in and carve out maybe portions of those projects, but not be a whole lot more on the floor because they're short. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, last one. Yes. I did that. My last position, I did two years of research in the land. Oh, yeah. I was in town, I was a homeowner for 100 years. They were only at all the way to me. And then the past 10 years, things are not changing. And mm -hmm. I, my job is to figure out how they perceive that. And I thought it was a conflict. According to the Lord, they actually um, accepted it and wanted more because their identity was that we are in the same country. Like, we need to make that on the eastern shore, the biggest thing I hear uh, going against solar panels is, you know, well, we're agricultural. And if you dig up our agriculture and you put in solar panels, what are we? That's not who we are. So if you find a way to change the dialogue from being either a, you know, to disorder that to a dismantle that, mm -hmm. and make solar energy and renewable energy compatible with that agricultural identity that's so deeply ingrained in the area, now we start changing the dialogue and starting to be real. I will tell, I will close with a story that um, is exactly on point. I think it's a really interesting perspective. So I was spending more time with Republican congressmen than I ever have before. And uh, I was at dinner with one recently from the great state of North Carolina, and he is a huge solar advocate. And his reason why he became a solar advocate was because he, someone in his district invited him, a business in his district invited him to a ribbon cutting of a solar array. And so he went to the ribbon cutting and two things happened. One was that the farmer told him that the lease payments he was getting for the solar array was what 
he was able, so he was able to keep the farm and the family, right? That, that, that additional income was what uh, allowed him to maintain the farm. And then secondly, they had uh, goats. They, they'd seeded the area around the uh, solar panels with this certain kind of grass, and they had certain goats, and they were grazing as goats do. Uh, and the, and it was, they, had, um, they had been able to develop uh, this product, basically. So they were solar goats. And so the local Whole Foods in the local town, the only goat meat they sold at Whole Foods was the solar goat. So it's sort of that ecosystem, and it speaks to that. And that is why he has a huge vote in the U.S. Congress for solar, because you made that connection real for him. So anyway. Thanks for being such a great audience. It's been a pleasure to spend the morning with you.